Hello, everyone. This is Sarah from CIS um, monthly webinar case series. Uh, tonight, we have Nancy who is a clinical fellow at Texas Children's Hospital, and she is going to present a case of CMV driven HLH. Um, Dr. Nicholas, thank you for um, the introduction, and thank you, CIS, for allowing me to share this case with you. Um, so our patient is a 14-year-old male. Um, at the end of August, he presented to urgent care with fever, and he was starting clindamycin for presumed sinusitis. He returned to urgent care a few days later because he continued to have fevers, and it was recommended for him to continue the clindamycin treatment. Two days after that, he presented to the emergency department still with fevers at this point, about a week of fevers, and was diagnosed with pneumonia. So he was discharged home with a script for Augmentin. A few hours later, before ever filling the Augmentin, he returned to the emergency department with fever, tachycardia, and hypotension, requiring epinephrine drip, and he was starting blood spectrum antibiotics for presumed sepsis and was admitted to the ICU. He continued to be febrile, so infectious disease was consulted, and he had a very thorough workup that included CMV, and his CMV PCR in the blood was noted to be 230,000 copies, and he was starting in cyclovir. The following day, he was noted to have bilateral pleural effusions requiring chest placement, and his pleural fluid was noted to be CMV positive as well. A few days later, he continued to be febrile and CMV PCR was repeated and now it had um, over doubled at 540,000 copies. So Foscarnet was added. And at this point, we as immunology got involved <laughs> given the um, degree of CMV viremia um, as well as CMV dissemination given the pleural fluid findings and how critically ill the patient was. So with regards to past medical history, really no recurrent infections, no prior admissions, no prior surgery. Mom actually described as a very healthy kiddo that never caught anything that was going around school. Family history was significant for a maternal uncle that passed away at one year of age due to high fevers of unknown etiology, but no known family history of immunodeficiency and mother and father are both healthy. Um, social history is remarkable for parents that are divorced and the patient has a paternal half-brother. So when we first met him, he was in respiratory distress, home BiPAP. His uh, lung exam was significant for reduced breath sound throughout the lungs, but the left much more than the right and increased work of breathing. And he also had a palpable spleen. Here is um, his CT scan where you can see the paraspinomegaly as well as consolidation over the um, right lung. So by the time we got consulted, he had had quite a bit of a workup. Um, his CVC was remarkable for pancytopenia with our, both neutropenia and lymphopenia, anemia with a hemoglobin of 4.8 or 6.8, and thrombocytopenia with platelets of 46. He had very elevated inflammatory markers, including ferritin and soluble IL-2. Um, evidence of hepatitis with elevated ACE and ALT, and as we talked about, positive CMV in both the plasma and the pleural fluid, but otherwise other viral studies were negative. Um, in, immunoglobin levels had also been collected. He had a normal AGA, a slightly low IgG for age, and then mildly elevated IgM, and 8 out of 14 protective strep pneumotiders. So given the persistent fever and splenomegaly, in addition to the pancytopenia, elevated ferritin, and soluble 2, um, the patient was diagnosed with HLH. So putting it all together, thus far we have a previously healthy 14-year-old male with disseminated CMV and HLH. Great. So, Um, yeah, it's Alexandra Freeman. So I think, you know, I'm supposed to help with the moderation, I guess, of this one, but um, do we want to start thinking about the differential at this point? The 
Do people in the group have ideas? Or maybe we can't figure it out from muting you. I just had a couple other questions about the um, the CAT scan that we saw there, because it looks very consolidated just for CMV. Was anything else found? Um, he, in the bronchial valvular lavage uh, candida grew, but nothing grew really from the um, pleural fluid. Okay, yeah, and probably candida, if that was, you know, it's not usually a cause of pneumonia. It just looks like a more of a dense infiltrate than one would expect to see. So, okay, so we have one differential coming up for XLP. Do you know if the patient was EBV immune? He was not. Okay, Zyap, which is good too. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so our differential included um, some of those things as well. We thought about familiar HLH, although we would have expected him to present much earlier in life than 14 years of age, Zyap, um, SAP deficiency, CD27, LRC4, NEMO, and then specific NK cell or immunodeficiencies associated with NK cell defects, like GATA2, MCM4, RTL1, and IRF8. So um, the additional workup that um, we did, um, we got lymphocyte studies and we show that consistent with what his CBC showed, he had panlymphopenia, but he had a predominance of um, T cells with a lot more CD8 relative to CD4 T cells. And in the peripheral um, blood, he had almost an absolute absence of B cells, marking 0.3% of his lymphocyte compartment. And he had a normal um, NK cell per, uh, percentage with a low absolute number. His bone marrow um, biopsy demonstrated hypocellular marrow with trilineage hematopoiesis and consistent with the diagnosis of HLH, increased histiocytes with occasional hemophagocytosis. And much like we saw in the peripheral blood and the uh, flow cytometry of the bone marrow showed no blast, but nearly complete absence of B cells. And cytology that was done showed that there were some cells with um, uh, abnormal chromosome analysis. Um, we went ahead and looked more closely at his NK cells as well. So NK cells, there are two main populations based on CD56 expression. You have your CD56 bright NK cells that those have proliferate potential and I also secrete cytokines, as well as your CD56 dim, dim population and those are the ones responsible for cytotoxicity. And what you can see in the dot plot is that where they control their um, minor but present population of CD56 right cells, that population is nearly absent in our patient. Um, when you actually look at the quantification in our patient, the bright population makes 0.2% of all lymphocytes. And when they quantify, they said there's one um, bright NK cell. So putting that to his presentation with our workup, we can now say we have a previously healthy 14-year-old male with disseminated CMV and HLH with B cell and bright NK cell deficiency. So um, does this change anybody's different, help narrow anybody's differential at all? I think it's also important to notice about the, yeah, the um, cytogenetic abnormalities. Lots of votes mm -hmm. for GATA2 deficiency. But you know that with the yeah the cytogenetic and also you know the lack of B cells but having immune globulins. Yeah, that's something that was pretty striking to us as well. So much like everybody was saying, we also thought about GATA too because of the abnormal bone marrow and concern for a myelodysplastic syndrome as well as the absence of B cells. And also this NK cell finding um, where much like we saw in our patient, um, patients with um, GATA2 deficiency um, can have an absence of bright NK cells. 
Um, and really what we did is, being his presentation was so striking, we did a whole exome like, sequencing before getting a lot of our labs back. Um, and he demonstrated that the patient indeed does have um, GATA2 deficiency. Um, whole exome like, sequencing showed a heterophagous pathogenic variant in GATA2. And while this variant hasn't been previously reported, it's predicted to be damaging. Interestingly, um, the father is also heterozygous for this variant, but he's asymptomatic. I just so, one question. Was the father's, who was the one that died? Was that the paternal brother? It was actually, I think it was actually maternal uncle, so it's probably completely unrelated. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so we have, um, Natty, there's somebody we have from the, uh, um, can he have two problems? Um, I'm not sure if you want to, uh, Dr. Yu, if you want to elaborate a little more on that. We have everybody muted. Okay. Um, so I think while he certainly can have um, more than one problem, um, I think got it to very clearly um, fits his B cell deficiency and K cell abnormalities, susceptibility to severe um, viral infections, as well as the abnormal cells within the bone marrow as precursor for myelodysplastic um, syndrome. So this kind of ties in with the current slide that we're looking at, that in GATA2 you can see all of that, and in addition, patients can have pulmonary blurioputinosis as well as sensor neural hearing loss. Um, so they've... Um, there's a paper actually looking at a cohort of patients with GATA2 and the immune abnormalities that they have seen were monocytopenia, B cell cytopenia, both of red in K cells and impaired in K cell cytotoxicity and CD4 lymphopenia. Um, and actually, the monocytopenia, B cell, in K cell, and CD4 T cell lymphopenia correlated with more active disease or the more number of major complications that the patients had. And our patient really had all of this criteria. Um, and ultimately, early diagnosis is critical to direct clinical management, preventive care, and family screening. And so now, dad is getting. Um, adequate screening, meaning that he's now known to have um, the same variant, and his stepbrother also has the same variant. So he's going to be getting routine monitoring. That's great. You know, just one thing to elaborate because of um, the question about the B cells, um, the B cells being absent with GATA2 deficiency. So, you know, because I think this is really classic in that the B cells are absent, but there's still immune globulins that are present. And it's because there's a progressive loss of the B cells over time. So, you know, you don't usually know about someone having GATA2 deficiency until they're sick like this when you see that lack of B cells. Um, so that's pretty characteristic of the deficiency, having that kind of disparity, discrepancy between the two. Um, I would say, you know, you know, the only other thing I wanted to point out about this case is, you know, I think when people hear about attitude deficiency, we think about the monocytopenia and, you know, people talk about that a lot. Um, but this patient actually had probably an increased number of monocytes. Is that correct? So he had about 10% monocytes, but his absolute Y count was 0 0.84. So he was so um, leukopenic that all cell lines were down. Oh, okay. Yeah, because it seemed like, um, you know, but we often see, you know, when people have GATA2 deficiency that, you know, the monocyte number can be very, very low. You know, you can have pretty much zero monocytes. But as they develop more myelodysplasia and are kind of headed more towards leukemia, then you can see the monocyte number actually increases through that period of time sometimes. So I thought, you know, it's hard to know because this patient wasn't followed for anything in the um, before this presentation. Um, we have seen, you know, bad CMV disease is seen sometimes as well as bad EBV disease. We had a patient with HLH associated with EBV as well and histiocytes in the bone marrow. Um, the only other thing is, is there any platelet finding on the bone marrow biopsy? They, um, actually, now that you mention it, he did have... Um, Megakaryocyte hyperplasia. Okay. Yeah, the, uh, 
Yeah, this characteristically, you know, they have the, the micro megakaryocyte. So, you know, these patients often have really funny um, megakaryocytes. And, you know, if a hematopathologist can sometimes recognize it just by how the megakaryocytes look. Hmm. So it, is the patient being transplanted? Yes. And has the yes. father had a bone marrow biopsy? He did. Um, he had some abnormal clones, but right now he's going to get surveillance. Yeah, I think, you know, it is, it's one of these diseases that has, you know, really variable penetrance. And we've had a lot of patients where, you know, the, the older parent is affected, but has minimal symptoms. Um, maybe they're acquiring kind of other, you know, second hits over time. Uh, oh, wait, I missed that question. Um, there was a question about, did the chromosome abnormality make sense? I think we can have a, there's a lot of different chromosomal abnormalities that can be associated with GATA2 deficiency when they develop myelodysplasia. I looked at those chromosomal abnormalities in specific, specifically, and there are some least one published um, report where it mentions um, that specific chromosomal abnormality being related with myelodysplastic syndrome although it's one of the more rare um, chromosomal abnormality scenes. Other time to look. Okay. Any other questions about this case? Oh wait, does dad, dad, dad does have the same defect. There's a question, does dad have the same defect? The answer was yes, that the dad has the mutation, but, um, right, but so, but the dad doesn't have the clinical findings so far. Is that correct? Yes, and I see the question now that says chromosomal. Do I, I don't know specifically what the abnormalities uh, in the bone marrow biopsy that dad has were and whether he had the same chromosomal abnormalities. It is important that, you know, these patients can progress from, you know, a little bit of uh, karyotype abnormality in the um, bone marrow biopsy to leukemia pretty quickly. So when we start seeing any signs of myelodysplasia, you know, we really recommend transplant for these patients before they get in trouble. Does that might not pick up? Oh, okay. Well, it sounds like um, the chromosomal. Well, the GATA2 deficiency, I'm looking at um, Carl's question. The GATA2 mutation was not somatic because the dad has the same mutation. So then there's secondary hits in terms of the um, somatic mutations in the bone marrow. That makes sense. Are there any other questions? You know, we've done, um, you know, we have a pretty big, at NIH, we have a pretty big transplant group for this disease. I think they've transplanted close to 50 patients now um, with a lot of success. So it is the, the thing to go with. Not everything is corrected with transplant. For instance, some patients have lymphedema, um, or there can be other somatic issues like the hearing loss that might not be corrected. Um, I thought the CT was funny, though. So I was just wondering if something else was there. Um, it looked very infiltrated for CMB. But really good case. Thank you. Thank you. I think while we're switching, there was one last, uh, while we're switching, it looks like there was one last question. When diagnosing that it is critical versus somatic mutations. Um, Dr. Niebuhr, if you're ready, we can move on to the second case, it looks like. So um, Dr. Niebuhr is going to be um, talking to a, journey, a two year journey to a diagnosis. All right. Thank you, everyone, for having me. We'll go ahead and get started with this interesting case. 
So the initial presentation is a seven-year-old biracial male who presented to clinic with a two-year history of chronic lymphadenopathy. It's actually an incidental finding in March 2016 when all of this started. He had non-painful cervical, axillary, and inguinal lymphadenopathy, and it waxed and waned in size, was not painful, um, and he didn't have fevers, night sweats, or weight loss. He was, had, did have some complaints of intermittent abdominal pain, some dysphagia, and was just a bit more fatigued than usual. Prior to this, he had numerous episodes of otitis media and had required eight sets of um, uh, PE tubes and meringotomy and along with an adenoidectomy, but no other health problems up to this point. So his immunizations were up to date. He, the family history, there was were a few odd things, but nothing associated with childhood disease. Um, they, for family social history, they do have three indoor cats. He lives with his mother and six siblings, one full sibling, five half siblings, and his mother does work at a nursing home. So when this started, he was sent to ENT first, and they did a partial excisional lymph node biopsy that showed reactive follicular hyperplasia with acute focal inflammation. And of course, the first concern was malignancy. So that was the second step. He went to hematology oncology, and their initial findings were not too concerning for malignancy. Um, they did note that inflammatory markers were slightly elevated. So the next stop after that was, of course, infectious disease, and they did look for Bartonella because of the cats, and they also looked for HIV, which was negative. They did place a PPD because of the mother working in a nursing home, which was also negative. And then they checked EBV and CNV titers, both, and there were, and several of the serologies were positive, both IgG and IgM. Um, a chest x-ray was also obtained that showed some kind of old lesions that th they thought were possibly old granulomatous disease, maybe histoplasma. Um, and they got some screening immunity labs. They did check IgG and subsets, which were normal. They did find IgA deficiency, and IgM was on the high side. And while, though he was fully vaccinated, his diphtheria and pneumococcal titers were not protective. So at this point, they then call immunology. And so this whole process from going to that initial biopsy to actually making it to immunology to clinic took about 10 or 11 months. Uh, and during this time, the patient's dysphagia had progressed. Uh, lymphadenopathy had continued to wax and wane, but was overall increased. So further laboratory studies were obtained, and there, the titers remained elevated, but the EVB quantitative PCR was undetectable. However, the CMV quantitative PCR was detectable. Um, had a normal oxidative burst. The CD107A mobilization and, lymph and the lymphocyte proliferation assays were borderline, but poor viability was noted on the specimens. Of course, this is shipping in December. Oh, which may have had something to do with it. Um, so this was all repeated later on. The initial lymphocyte subsets also showed some abnormalities. There was CD4 lymphopenia, kind of relative expansion of, um, of uh, RO cells, where the RAs were a bit down. Uh, and the same kind of skewing was seen on the CD8 cells. And then the CD19 cells, while the overall counts were normal, there were uh, decreased switched memory B cells with the relative increase in both plasma blast and transitional B cells. And there was kind of a relative expansion of NK cells. However, there was no increase in alpha, beta, double negative T cells. So at this point, uh, maybe we can kind of stop and see what people are thinking with regards to initial differential and um, any further testing we should be obtaining or repeating at this point. And so I'm seeing a lot about um, activated PA3 kinase delta syndrome, looking for senescent T cells, any other thoughts?
All right, so let's go ahead and keep going. So, um, and it looks like when you, you have one more question. Sorry, it to looks like you question. question about yes, the, the check screen. This child was born well after check screening was started, so there was no check screen. So pretending that you didn't have that double negative, the normal double negative T cell population, you know, ALPS and KRAS and NRAS would all be on this, um, along with XLP, ZIAP, APDS and PASLI, CTLA-4, LRBA, and NEMO deficiency, primarily because that CD107A test was a bit borderline. Chest CT was not obtained on this patient. Any other questions or thoughts at this point? Okay, so we did. I we did go ahead and repeat some of the testing, and with repeat testing, the CD one hundred and seven A improved. That was a little on the low end. SAP and ZIAP expression were both normal. Um, Perforin expression was decreased with increased granzyme B expression, and he was revaccinated for um, diphtheria and pneumovax with excellent protective titers. Um, so ultrasound was obtained that showed multiple enlarged cervical lymph nodes, bit greater on the left with some hyperemia. So he would eventually had developed symptoms of obstructive sleep apnea and went for tonsillectomy, so it would, which showed, again, follicular lymphoid hyperplasia. Cervical lymph node was also removed at this time since he had many to choose from, which showed similar pathology with no evidence of lymphoma and no granulomata. However, CMV staining was requested and was positive. So at this point, I think all of us would agree that genetic testing is in order. However, his insurance did not agree. So over the course of the next year, there was a series of appeals and denials and appeals and denials. And after, um, and finally, after an additional 11 months, uh, we were able to obtain genetic testing through the total blueprint at Baylor that showed a heterozygous muta pathogenic mutation in PIK3R1 which was consistent with activated PI3 kinase delta syndrome. Mother, so at the father is not involved in this child's life and was unavailable for genetic sequencing, but mother was negative by Sanger sequencing. So, um, so with this, so just a quick review. So for activated PI3 kinase delta syndrome, the phenotype is recurrent infections, primarily upper respiratory tract, so sinusitis, otitis, and uh, lower respiratory tract infections with pneumonia and bronchiectasis. They also get chronic EBV and CMV viremia. They do get non-malignant lymphoproliferation, although there is an increased risk of lymphoma. Um, they also have lymphadenopathy, splenomegaly, hepatomegaly, which on biopsy shows atypical follicular hyperplasia. There is an increased risk of autoimmunity, including cytopenias, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, arthritis, uh, endocrinopathies, and also immune dysregulation. Um, to answer a couple questions, they, he has one full sibling who did eventually get genetic testing and was not affected. Um, and while he is on the small side, he has been growing at his, he has been tracking along his percentiles for growth. Um, the schematic on the side shows that uh, one of the joint pathways um, that this signals through is the mTOR pathway. And so, sorry, so we'll just taking a little, uh, another look at one of the papers that published, was recently published that showed more of an expanded phenotype with the larger group of patients. And the T cells are typically reduced in these patients, especially recent thymic immigrants. However, um, the rest of the T cell populations look fairly normal, though there is this skewing towards uh, senescence. The B cells show some variations, but there most a lot of patients did have reduced um, class switch memory B cells. NK cells varied; most were normal, um, and most a lot of patients did have some abnormalities in their immunoglobulin population. 
There are quite a few treatment options. Since so many patients develop dyskamaglobulinemia with time, a lot of patients are started in immunoglobulin replacement therapy. Antimicrobial prophylaxis varies with some patients on anti, uh, antibiotics, other patients on antivirals, sometimes on treatment antivirals, depending on the rare disease burden, and some on antifungal. One of the mainstays of therapy at this point is immunomodulation, where a lot of patients go on systemic corticosteroids primarily to manage their autoimmune manifestations. But serolimus is becoming more frequently used with some success, specifically as in this idea of precision medicine, where we take a medication that specifically targets the abnormal pathway to try and correct it. So while serolimus is technically suppressing the immune system, it's suppressing it to allow it to function better. Um, recently, a, a series of 11 patients from seven centers was published. Um, these patients all had recurrent infections, lymphoproliferation, and or lymphoma despite treatment. Um, there was a lot of variability in graft source and preparator regimens, varied from uh, reduced intensity. A couple of patients had myeloblation. But at the follow-up, and it was varied for how far out patients were at the time of this publication, but they did have 81% survival, which is fairly comparable for more for a lot of, of transplant for quite a few immune deficiencies. And so especially with the complications that these patients develop with time, one thing we could be considering is should we be thinking about transplant younger in life? Um, but then came along a new treatment, Lines and please pardon me if I'm not pronouncing this right, Linialisib, which is a small molecule inhibitor of P110 delta, which is exactly where our, these patients have their abnormality. So the, uh, um, so a 12-week open-label study was conducted with six patients, and they were allowed to updose the individual patients. And all patients had improvements in their lymphadenopathy, splenomegaly, and cytopenias with no adverse effects over the treatment period. And I believe, and maybe Dr. Rao can comment more on this, but I believe the study is ongoing um, and is expanded down to the age of 12 which yeah, might correct. provide some yeah, additional correct. options and for patients, patients in the future. We, all six patients that were on this initial trial have gone on to continue on treatment, uh, what we call extension phase. They have been on this treatment. The longest is three years. The shortest is one year now. So one to three years, they have been on this treatment without any adverse events. And then we have opened it up for a placebo-controlled uh, treatment now, and we are giving 70 milligram BID for three months when we don't know what we are giving in terms of it's a double blind placebo control trial. And then, uh, if they go through that successfully, we roll them over into uh, extension phase. And uh, we have uh, recruited uh, three, five patients here. Three have received the treatment, two are going through the screening process and as we speak tomorrow we will be enrolling our first r1 patient on this trial that will be the first patient with r1 defect with, until now we were only enrolling pic 3 cd defect and now it is open for r1 also but unfortunately your patient will not be eligible because he is very young so i think we will have to consider other treatments as you already attributed All right, so back to this patient. So because, again, of age, he was started on serolimus for treatment, which did significantly improve his CMV load. He dropped down to undetectable. His lymphadenopathy really improved along with his symptoms of dysphagia, and his energy over and sense of well-being also improved. However, as he continued on therapy after about six months, he started to develop oral ulcers, which required a dose increase. And with the dose incre decrease, uh, his CMV viral load has started to climb again. He was referred to a uh, transplant for evaluation, but his brother was not a match, and there are no available donors. So for now, we are monitoring him and continuing the serolimus at a lower dose and waiting to see what his treatment options are as things evolve with this disease. 
usually sirolimus induced oral ulcers are self limiting so if you go up on the dose a little bit now maybe he will tolerate that's what i will re recommend thank you and uh, those of you who are uh, who have access to esid abstracts dr uzel actually presented the sirolimus experience from our institution at esid the recent esid meeting and i don't know whether the poster is still up on the system at least the abstract is there which shows you can actually put these patients on sirolimus and get a lot of mileage out of it by we have i think longest patient is on it for 5 years now and the spleens nicely shrink just like what we see in alps patients so sirolimus is not a bad drug to hang on to in these patients uh, to Keep answer going. Carl's question, I believe it was serolimus related because as soon as we decrease the dose, the ulcers all resolved. Yeah, exactly. No, it's, it is serolimus related. I know that. But the point is, you can just re-challenge and we will be fine. That's what we have seen. Does so. anyone have any thoughts on monitoring for lung disease? Because this patient is asymptomatic, but there were some abnormalities on the chest x-ray. Usually we do at least one chest CT and then sit tight if you don't have any problems. Does anyone else have any different thoughts on this case? I will say one of the more interesting things about this case is how long it took to get to a diagnosis, mm -hmm. even though from the initial laboratory findings the diagnosis was already pretty heavily suspected. I think somebody picked up uh, from your presentation as as soon as you showed IgM, someone jumped out and said pick 3 CD. I think that is the way to go. If you see a patient with big lymph nodes and uh, high IgM, if you have the luxury of genetic testing, I think pick 3 CD should be in the list. Unfortunately, I know you tried and you got pushed back from the insurance companies. And I think CIS is working on enabling the investigators uh, to some extent so that these insurance companies don't play games with the genetic testing requests for especially sick children, I think, going forward. Um, Dr. Rack, could you comment on, uh, Amit has an excellent question, what about monitoring for the malignancies? What have you been doing yes. with your group? The, you, I think, uh, again, that was another abstract that was presented at ESID by Dr. Pitaluga, who is a hematopathologist at N NCI. And we have a large group of patients now that we have accumulated. And I think, depending on how you count them, anywhere from 20 to 30 percent malignancies, that is much higher than what I have seen in the other rare immunological condition called ALPS, as you know. So we necessarily i will not go looking for lymphadenopathy and lymph no lymphoma by doing serial ct scans because that's too too invasive but you have to still monitor for uh, sudden enlargement of lymphadenopathy focal enlargement of lymph nodes systemic symptoms like uh, loss of weight loss of appetite or anything uh, but having said all that a lot of these patients do have significant uh, gut associated lymphadenopathy leading to intersusception and then you end up resecting the gut or resecting the lymph nodes mass from the gi tract and then uh, you have to evaluate carefully for malignancies and uh, we have a, pa a couple of patients where we looked for intersusception so, i mean di diagnosis of lymphoma is preceded by so called intersusception so that is one of the kind of triggers if you want to be aggressive in looking for lymphoma. Carl also has a, another great question about um, uh, any concern for opportunistic infections while on the rapamycin. No, we don't do PCP prophylaxis, if that is the hidden question. We have not seen PCP in this disease, but if you are going to give them corticosteroids for the long haul, then of course you have to do pentamidine or Bactrim or something. Uh, but a lot of these patients go on Bactrim on a daily dose, double strength daily, if it is a bigger kind of teenage kid. Uh, the reason being you are you have to deal with the sinopulmonary infections, whether you like it or not. They have significant sinopulmonary issues. So you end up putting them on Bactrim 
for the long haul. So that is what we have done in many of these patients uh, in terms of uh, prophylactic antibiotics, but we don't do PCP prophylaxis, if that is the question. Any mm -hmm. other questions or thoughts on this case from the attendees? Um, Dr. Rao, what would you say about IVIG for these patients? You know, um, from what I saw, you typically start when you start to see the you know, drops in IgG levels for a vaccine response. Yeah, you can do with that. That can be your trigger. But on the other hand, if you want to monitor them for their sinopulmonary infections, if you do HSCT and if they're older kids, basically, as they get older, you may see some lung findings, but what I have noticed is if you start a patient on IVIG very early, so somebody gets a diagnosis of CVID and then PI3 kinase doesn't get diagnosed for 10 years in their first, first, but they have been on IVIG for the long haul, then usually their lungs are clean. They don't have major problems. Those patients who don't get IVIG started very early in childhood end up with bronchiectasis and a lot more pulmonary problems. That's what at least we have seen so far. And Natalia has a question about the colitis, if it's common or not. From what I saw with the larger group, it was one of the more uncommon manifestations. I agree. It, yeah. It is not as common as CTLA-4, let's say. But it is there. It is the problem. But I think massive lymphadenopathy and massive splenomegaly with uh, um, bronchiectasis and lung problems in case if, if, if they have lung issues, that's the major presenting finding in these patients. But otherwise, they don't have the gut disease as a major problem. But some of them we are seeing uh, as we follow them for the long haul do develop some aspects of uh, gut-associated uh, symptoms, and we are looking at uh, some food allergy and uh, eosinophilic uh, GI disease If in a couple of patients, so we are looking at all of them. So keep those in mind. If you're, if patient comes with gut symptoms, do endoscopies and see what, what you see. I think that's how we will all learn. Uh, had another... Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Um, a couple other questions about the about transplant because mm -hmm. the malignancy risk is there and it does increase with age. Should everyone go to transplant? Should they go to transplant when the when the available medications aren't managing their symptoms, or should they go to transplant once they develop cancer for the first time? So you want me to take it? Since I have the Let's audience ahead, here. Please. <laughs> because I just recently came out of ASH meeting where we had this discussion uh, in the JMML working group meeting. I said, if you tell me bone marrow transplantation is as safe as circumcision or appendectomy, then yes, everybody should get a bone marrow transplantation. Otherwise, we are still killing patients in the process of transplanting. So you have to weigh the risk benefit in terms of what are the risks of transplanting and transplant-related complications? And a chronic GVHD is horrible. Ask Jack Bleasing, he will tell you. He and I transplanted an ALPS patient with a fast defect who I will never transplant today, but we didn't know he had that at that time. Uh, we transplanted him because he had relentless uh, pneumococcal sepsis due to splenectomy in his childhood. And we said, oh, we'll give him a new immune system. And yes, we gave him a new immune system, but this kid is stuck with lifelong chronic GVH. And I, I don't think you, sometimes you don't think about it. You only get stuck up with this mortality rates in transplant, but post-transplant, there are a lot of things. And if you talk to more transplanters, you learn that there are things. People don't usually publish transplant failures, they only publish transplant successes. And I'm a pediatric hematologist and oncologist. I've taken care of children in transplant units as well as in leukemia units. So I, I, I have my own kind of strong opinions here, maybe.
Uh, Mario has another question about the role of CMV as a consequence or a trigger. And I would say, honestly, it's both. Because the CMV triggers the T cells to try and contain it. Yep. And as the T cells try and contain it, they proliferate. And as they proliferate, you get the lymphadenopathy, and then you start to get all of these other unfortunate consequences, including the autoimmunity and the immune dysregulation. And we have seen a large proportion of patients do have EBV viremia associated with this disease. And that may be the driving force behind transplant. That's what, uh, I mean, the driving force behind uh, lymphoma development. And once they develop lymphoma, I think you have to proceed with bone marrow transplantation. So the other question is you can flip it around and say, why wait till they get a lymphoma? Just transplant everybody. I mean, make it easier to transplant, then yes, everybody should be transplanted. And Carl mentions that surprising is EBV negative. You know, um, we have felt that the positive EV, EBV titers were probably, there was some cross-reaction with CMV. Hmm. So I question if he's ever truly had EBV or not. So it is another thing I'm monitoring, and we have talked at length about what additional symptoms they need to look for. And Carl does mention that the EBNA is fairly specific. Um, and the chi this Dr. child is not on IVIG, correct, right now? He is not because yeah. his labs have looked good so far. Exactly. But in all fairness, I have it's not elevated. really gotten that CT scan to look for bronchiectasis. No, no I think uh, you should do at least one uh, chest CT as a baseline and then sit tight if it, uh, that is clean. That's, that's the only thing. That way you know you're not doing you're not reading. And, and Sarah would like to know if any of the patients on serolimus have gone on to develop lymphoma. No. Oh, I'm glad you asked, as if I planted you. We, I <laughs> keep it. Uh, Thank you, Sarah. Uh, no, 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 no patient I know in the entire series of ALPS with a fast defect, which where I have the most experience, nor have any of the patients in Dr. Gulbuzel's uh, collection with. Uh, PI3 kinase defects have touch wood developed lymphoma yet, as yet. So are we preventing lymphoma genesis by giving them serolimus is a question that many of you who are much younger in the audience right now will answer. I think it requires long-term kind of observation. You can't tell it in five years or two years or three years, maybe 10 years from now. If you have a few hundred patients on serolimus with these primary immunodeficiencies, that will be a global question that should be asked at the end of 10 years of treatment. Um, I have another question to ask, Ashley. Um, Dr. How, where do you start with your goal level for serolimus? We usually, like, the serolimus goal is different in different diseases. Let me put it that way. So if you are doing it for... Uh, ALPS, you can stay between 7.5 and 10. If you are doing it for PI3 uh, kinase, you try to go a little higher between 10 and 12. And in CTLA-4, usually Dr. Uzel pushes it up to 15. And uh, the reason is, I think uh, the goal is different in different diseases, as you know. We are trying to shrink lymph nodes and spleen in ALPS and PI3 kinase. That is our major kind of thrust. Whereas we are trying to bring the T-reg cells back in CTLA-4 defect. And there, I think you seem to be requiring a little higher doses if you can push it. So the goal should be to run around 10, if you ask me, for PI3 kinase between 10 and 12 will be good enough. But 15 is desirable in CTLA-4 and other, where you have a different kind of. But uh, remember, it takes a long time for seeing any shrinkage of lymph nodes and spleen with uh, serolimus. On the other hand, if you go back and look at our blood paper, after giving linealisib 70 milligram twice a day for one month, we could see measurable difference. And now when we are looking at the same patients year, two years, three years later, we are seeing dramatic decrease in spleen size, which is way better than what I have ever seen with serolimus. So I think in terms of 
reducing cytopenias, improving cytopenias, reducing lymphadenopathy, lymphoproliferation. I think linear lysib, if we can take it to uh, licensing and uh, market, then I think that will be another approach to modulate PI3 kinase pathway to for a lot of uh, primary immunodeficiency disorders. That's what I think. That is my kind of uh, feeling at this point, provided we don't see any real bad adverse events with uh, linear lysib, which we are watching anyway. Does anyone have, else have any other thoughts or questions? Diabetes with serolimus. In uh, CTLA-4 patients, we have seen diabetes uh, with or without serolimus. There is an association of diabetes and CTLA-4, and Dr. Uzel will be the right person to do a seminar just like this in CTLA-4, if you ask me. No, I have not seen diabetes with serolimus, so I cannot comment on that. Okay. Well, um, thank you, um, Dr. Rao and Dr. Nibor and the audience for um, asking such great questions. Um, there's no more questions.